Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It doesn't matter who you are, what ethnic group you belong to, what nation you reside in, what language you speak. None of those things are important. We all have something in common, and that is this. If we're alive, we're going to encounter temptation. We are going to have, if you're a believer, your faith will be challenged. By who? By the enemy. Now, we're going to be looking at a very uh, well-known passage of Scripture having to do with Messiah being driven into the wilderness in order that he be tempted by the enemy. And it's interesting because one of the ways that Satan is revealed, he's called a tempter healer, but the most frequent way that we encounter him in this passage is known as the devil. Why is that important? Because that comes from a Greek word where we get the English word diabolical. It has to do with someone that is cunning, someone that is wise, intelligent, but uses that wisdom and knowledge for a wrong purpose, to deceive and to defeat others. That their will is accomplished, not God's will and not what's best for other people. So we need to realize we have an enemy. And if we are, are studying correctly the Word of God, God's Word teaches us what we need to know so that we can live successfully. What is successfully? It is obediently to the Word and the will of God. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 3. The book of Matthew in chapter 3. Now, I made mention last week that the last thing that we saw was Yeshua. Being, having been instructed his, his legal father, Joseph, in a dream to go to the Galilee. Now, this is important for a couple reasons. Because the Galilee is mentioned prophetically as the place, and we'll see this later on, where Messiah is going to begin to shine, reveal, to reveal his truth, his identity, and what he's going to do. We'll come to that, but before that, we're going to see something else. He was in the Galilee in a place called Nazareth, or what we say in English, Nazareth. And I mentioned how that is in regard to someone who says no to temptation, no to the things of the enemy, and yes to God, someone who keeps the Word of God. Messiah is known as that. He's called that, but here's the key. He is also going to be challenged. Who we are in God is going to be challenged by the enemy. And how do we overcome that? Well, that's exactly what we're going to learn today. So look with me, as I said, chapter 3, verse 1, we read here. And in the days, in those days, John, what John? John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist arrived proclaiming in the wilderness of Judea. Now, the wilderness, right there, that word, desert or wilderness, however it's translated in your Bible, is full of revelation. That word, whenever it comes across that in the Bible, what should come into our mind? Dependence upon God. If you do not live in a way that demonstrates your trust, your reliance, your dependence upon God, you will not be spiritually successful. You will not know joy. You will not know God's provision in your life. Now, the wilderness of Judea, what it tells us is this. When we depend upon God, remember that word Judea, it has to do with praise. 
When we depend upon God, the outcome is going to be praise. God's going to be glorified. We're going to be living a praiseworthy life, and a praiseworthy life glorifies God. So this is the context that is being set up for rightly understanding this third chapter. And it came about in those days that John the Baptist came, the implication is came on the scene, he arrived. He was proclaiming in the wilderness or the desert of Judea, verse 2, and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Literally has drawn near. Now, why is that? All of this is getting ready for the revealing of Messiah, for him to begin his earthly ministry. So he speaks about it, and notice here what the emphasis is. John's message is the kingdom of heaven, one that resides there but is going to come into this world. Verse 3, he says, well, let's go back to verse 2 for a second. I want to emphasize this word, metanoia, repentance. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, has grown near. Repentance. It is foundational for anyone who's going to live a faith that's pleasing to God. Repentance, that word, metanoia, comes from two Greek words. Noia is uh, knowledge. It comes from the mind, the mind being full of something, revelation. And the word meta, well, it can mean after, so after arriving, receiving this knowledge, or it can mean meta with which has to do with with knowledge. So with knowledge or after receiving knowledge, we should respond. And what should we do? We turn to God. That's what repentance is. So John called the people to turn to God, to repent. Repent, turning to God away from sin in light of the significant time. Now verse 3. For this is the word by Isaiah the prophet saying, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Who's that Lord? No question about it. The context is Messiah. That God is doing something. He's at work and things need to be ready for that. So he says, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. Now notice, his paths. There's many different ways that we find ourselves coming in contact with that one message, the gospel. In other words, Messiah meets people in a variety of different places, but there's only one Messiah and there's only one way into the kingdom of God. So many different ways that lead to him. That is, sometimes people find him in the times of difficulty, of defeat, of sorrow. Other people find him not even looking. Things are just normal in their life, but they're confronted with the truth. So many different experiences lead to truth. For some people, it's uh, uh, sadness. Other people, they have encountered something that's good, and they're saying, why did this good thing happen to me? And they come to faith. God can use a multiplicity of ways to bring people to faith. So we read here, make straight the paths, his pathways. This is the same John, or John himself, however we want to translate that. John himself, he's the one having his cloth of camel's hair. Now what does this tell us? Well, camel hair in this day and culture was, was garbage refuse. People didn't use it for clothes, but only the poorest people that had nothing else, they would use that. So the fact, and this is emphasized here, that John is dressed in camel's hair, it speaks about his poverty and his uh, not fitting into normal society. People that had uh, camel's hair at that day, well, they would look down at them as, as the poorest of the poor and outcasts. This is how John is, is presented by this world. Also, it says, not only did he have camel's hair clothes, but he had a leather belt around his waist. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us this is the posture for service. Someone would gird themselves 
in order to labor, to do work, to serve. Don't you remember in John's Gospel, we see that near Passover, Messiah girded himself, taking a towel and a basin of water, and he washed the feet of the disciples. All of this speaks about his service, his humility. Well, John displayed that same thing when it says that he had, look carefully at the scripture, where it says that he had a leather belt around his waist. Verse 4, the second half, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now here again, we've talked about this. Locusts, if you look, for example, in the Talmud, you will find in the Talmud in Masechet Chulin, and chapter, I believe, 8 or 9, it speaks about locusts being kosher, not all, but some of them. And what we realize here is that locusts were never sell, sold in the market. Someone who ate locusts, they had to do something. They had to go and catch them themselves. Why? They weren't that tasty. And that's why it says they ate wild honey. What's wild honey? Not bee honey, but uh, date honey. It's kind of a jam that if uh, dates fell to the ground, you would only use them in making this kind of jam. So John would eat locusts, kind of dip, smeared with this, this cheap, inexpensive date honey. And what the scripture is saying is John didn't think about clothes. John didn't think about food. That's usually what we think about. We like to be in fine garments and we like good food. John, not so much. He was more interested in the things of the kingdom. And we see that he had a kingdom context. Why? Because he began to cry in dependence upon God in the wilderness, calling the people to repent, to turn to God. Why? The imminency of the kingdom of God, Messiah, was going to begin to, to come. Look now to, to verse 5. And went out unto him Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the regions of the Jordan. Now, this is important because what's John doing? Well, what's he called? He's called Yochanan. His name has to do with the grace of God or the favor of God being placed upon him. Yochanan, but his title is Yochanan Ha Matbil, meaning John the Baptist. And baptism was to, to be prepared for something. For example, the priests and the Levites, before they served in the temple or the tabernacle, they would immerse themselves. And it brought about a change ceremonially of status from going to that which is not prepared to that which is prepared. So baptism, there's many different messages to it, all biblical, all related, but one is it's of preparation. John is saying, in other words, get ready for the kingdom of God. Get ready because Messiah is near. That's what he speaks about when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Messiah's coming. And we need to realize that Messiah, this Messiah, Ben Yosef, he calls the people to repentance because he's going to deal with their sinfulness. So we find here that many were coming. Coming from, notice what the scripture says, from Jerusalem, Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan. And they were being baptized in the Jordan by him. And something else, remember when I said to you, names are important? The term Jordan comes from a Hebrew word which means to go down. Now, we know something. If you're in Jerusalem, you go down to the Jordan. If you're in Samaria, you go down to the Jordan. If you are in what we call Jordan today, Moab or Ammon, any of those places, you have to leave, those are higher grounds, and you have to go down to the Jordan. The Jordan is a term that speaks to humility. So specifically, they call that river the Jordan because it speaks of humility going down humbling yourself so from all of this region they were being baptized in the jordan by him and what were they doing confessing their sins 
verse 7. And seeing many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming unto his baptism. Now this is important because we know elsewhere in the scripture, everyone, everyone recognized John as a prophet. They understood that he was not someone that spoke in light of what the people wanted to hear. In fact, we know, and we'll see this later on, because of his commitment to the laws of God. Now isn't it interesting? John had a great commitment to the laws of God that he would not compromise the Word of God and, and put his approval on a marriage that was not Torah observant, that did not go along with the requirements of the Word of God. He said no, he suffered and ultimately he died because of that. Everyone recognized that John was serious about the Word of God. And this is the one that, that God placed an anointing upon him in order to herald the coming of Messiah. And remember what the scripture says? Of those born of women, no one is greater than John. He is someone who had exceedingly favor placed upon him because of his great and, and exceedingly serious commitment to the things of God and the kingdom of God. So he saw many of who? the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, these individuals, Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sadducees rejected much of the Scripture. They only were individuals that spoke and acknowledged the Torah, the commandments of God. But because of their rejection of the rest of Scripture, they did not believe in the kingdom. They did not believe in an afterlife. They did not believe that God was active in this world they didn't believe in angels none of those things but they came out as well as the Pharisees who they had kind of replaced the law of God with their own traditions but because everyone was coming out to John everyone was acknowledging him John was revered as yes this man was sent from God because of that the Pharisees and the Sadducees went out as well and, and John, he had discernment. He saw their hypocrisy, and notice what he said. Verse, verse 7. When he saw them, he said to them, You children of vipers, who informed you to flee from the coming wrath? Now I want to say two things. First of all, John said, Who informed you? He knew they weren't listening to the prophets. In other words, what caused you to come out? And the second thing is, John spoke clearly about the kingdom of God and the coming wrath. And realize something. That kingdom will not come and be established until first the judgment, the wrath of God, falls upon this world. And I'm talking about the kingdom in its fulfillment in Messiah returning and establishing that kingdom, that millennial kingdom for a thousand years, first, the judgment, the wrath of God will fall. And that's what the scripture is revealing to us. Verse 8. Therefore, he didn't reject them. He simply said, if you're coming out, he says, therefore, do or make fruit which is worthy of repentance. See, his baptism was a baptism of repentance, and there should be an outcome, fruitfulness. Verse 9, And do not think to say um, in yourselves, we have Father Abraham. Now, I would uh, just circle that part of verse 9. It clearly says here, and I did something. Last night, I looked at 28 versions of the Bible translations. And a lot of very good translations, but only one had it correct. And that is the International Standard Version. All the rest, all the rest, added words and changed them around. And we need not do that. What the scripture literally says, verse, verse 9, And do not uh, think to say in yourselves, so don't consider saying to yourself, that you don't need to repent, that you don't need Messiah, saying that we have Father Abraham. Now most say we have Abraham as our father. But the word ours there is the word our is not there. 
And we see something. We see that the word father and Abraham are in the exact same grammatical construction. They are nouns, and we see that they are accusative, masculine, singular nouns. They go together. If we say differently, like most translations, don't say that we have Abraham as our father. This is not right. It literally says, do not say that we have Father Abraham. For I say to you that God is able out of stones, these stones, to raise up children to Abraham. Don't think that you're okay, that you're secure spiritually because of some heritage that you have, because you are a physical descendant from Abraham. No, realize that everything that Messiah is speaking about, first and foremost, it's to the Jewish people, that they would get right to God with God in order to influence the nations. Now, we know that that, for the most part, did not happen. Our rebelliousness is not going to thwart the things of God, but our rebelliousness will keep us from receiving the blessings of God. So he tells them, realize, it is not that God's dependent upon you, that he needs you. He can raise up heirs for Abraham from stones, verse 10. Now, what he wants to tell us in verse 10 is this, judgment is coming. And that judgment that's coming, well, it is going to manifest itself in two ways. I don't want to go into that, but I do want to speak about verse 10 and that judgment. It says, and already is the axe laid against the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not make good fruit is cut, is made to be cut, and into the fire it is cast. So he says, judgment is coming, and we realize something. Forty years later, because by and large, Israel did not receive this message. A remnant did. There's always that faithful remnant. But because the nation as a whole did not, what came? Their judgment. And we see because of Israel's judgment, what happens? The kingdom is pushed away. Because as Messiah, and we'll see this many, many months from now, we'll see that until Israel gets right with God, and this is something that God will not compromise, will not change. Until Israel gets right with God, the kingdom of God won't be established. Let me just pause for a moment and talk about a false teaching that's going on. That false teaching has to do with Israel. And when Israel gets right with the Lord, We know something. That will happen, but it's not going to bring about some worldwide revival as some are teaching. No, when Israel gets right with God, Messiah is going to establish his kingdom. The time for the nations, the world, to get right with God is now because when the fullness of the nations come, God is going to turn back his attention to Israel. Israel is going to come to faith after a time of great tribulation and trials. That's what the scripture talks about when it speaks about Jacob's tribulation or Jacob's trouble. And after that trouble, we find Israel's going to, because of it, turn and say, where is God? Blessed is this one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a call for Messiah. Messiah is going to hear that, respond, and the kingdom's going to be established. Look now to verse verse 10 again. He speaks about Judgment is near, that axe has already been laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit, it's cut and cast into fire, verse 11. He says, on one hand, I baptize you in water of repentance, but there is one coming after me mightier than me, and this one, it says here, I am not worthy to bear his sandals. This one, it says, will baptize, once again, Holy Spirit. Baptize in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit and fire. What is that fire for? It is a fire that is for the purpose of edification. That baptism of the Holy Spirit that he's speaking about, that every believer, you believe, you receive that. It's not some second 
outpouring of the Spirit. It's mentioned the Holy Spirit and fire because fire has a, don't miss this, a refining characteristic. When, when metal is put into fire, the impurities are, are surfaced, they are revealed and they can be taken away. That's what the Holy Spirit does in a believer's life. He moves in order that those things that are displeasing to God, realize the context here. The context is repentance, turning to God. And when we turn to God by faith, receiving Messiah, and receiving that Holy Spirit into our life, it brings God's order. It gets rid of those things that are against the purposes, the plans, the orders of God. So he says, you know, I'm coming with the baptism of water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me, he is greater than me, mightier than me. I baptize with water. He's going to baptize through his baptism is the Holy Spirit and fire. Look at verse 12. Whose willowing fork is in his hand, and he will cleanse the threshing floor, his threshing floor, and he will gather up his wheat into the barn, and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, pay attention to verse 12. What an important verse and what it reveals. He says here concerning Messiah, he has a willowing fork. What's the purpose of a willowing fork? Very simple. Separation. Messiah, that gospel, divides. It's going to separate the sheep from the goats. So he says, whose willowing fork is already in his hands. What he's going to do? He's going to clean the threshing floor. And he's going to take that which is good. Notice the image. He says, with that grain, his grain or his wheat. You, you thresh that with that fork. And it causes that which is not grain, that is the chaff, to be separated. And that chaff, that, that which is not fruitful, that is going to be cast into what? It says it will be burnt up with unquenchable fire. That word for unquenchable is where we get the English word asbestos. Asbestos doesn't burn up and in. What it's saying here is that the judgment is eternal. Those who teach, oh, when you're dead, you're dead, or there's a punishment, but it ends. No, it does not. It goes on and on and on. And that's why it's so important to repent, to bear fruit, to testify of one's faith in Messiah Yeshua. Well, I'm out of time until next week. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.